First of all, our location. Are we ready? Our location. This place is called Banyas, named after the god Pan. Muslims or Arabs can't pronounce the difference between P and B, so they call it Banyas, but it was, should have been Panyas from the god Pan. In the intertestamental period, this was a center of the worship of Pan, a god associated with love, fertility, things of that nature, noted for his nymphs. The pagan priests of Pan during the Seleucid period, when well, this was under Syrophoenician Greek control, practiced their religion by surrogate sex with animals, specifically goats. What was interesting about Pan is, Pan was a god who pretended to be a man. Pan was a god who pretended to be a man. Now, here, the Rhodians built a temple to Caesar. However, the Caesar was Caesar Augustus, formerly Octavius. Some of the Roman emperors were deified posthumously by the Roman Senate. He was the first emperor who was deified during his lifetime. Now that's important. Whenever you see a man deified as God, it is an important picture of the Antichrist. When Jesus was born, you had an emperor who claimed to be God incarnate. Remember when they went to Bethlehem to number the people. In order to gain economic control of the known world, the people had to be numbered. Well, so, in his first coming, it'll be in his second coming. There'll be a man claiming to be a divine being who will actually number people to gain economic control of the known world. We have to understand what Caesar did and how he was in the character of Antichrist to understand what's coming in the future. What was important about the Herodians is they pointed the Jews towards this pagan belief system where a man would actually be deified. So what you had here was the worship of a god in Greek mythology who pretended to be a man and the worship of a man who pretended to be a god. The Lord Jesus comes here and he challenges the gods of this world on their own turf because he was not a god who pretended to be a man nor was he a man who pretended to be a god. He was both god and man, fully human and fully divine. That's why he comes here. He was challenging the gods of the Greco-Roman world on their own turf. What the Fortis Antonio was for Jerusalem, this was for Galilee. An offense to them. It represented Roman or pagan Roman dominion over their nation and even over their religion because of the way it was situated. Jesus comes here on the slope of Mount Hermon. The Mount of Transfiguration was certainly not Mount Tabor as the Greek Orthodox Church and the Roman Church maintain the Mount of Transfiguration was here. He went to an exceedingly high mountain. This is the exceedingly high mountain, snow-capped about seven and a half months of the year, where Jesus is transfigured up above us, having challenged the gods of this world above us. As we pointed out in our Bible study the other night, the Transfiguration is the closest picture we have in the Bible to the rapture and resurrection. You have Moses, a man who died faithful to God, you have Elijah, a man who never died, but who was raptured, and Jesus, we shall be as he is. It doesn't matter if you're dead in Christ when he comes, or alive in Christ when he comes, we meet him in the air, okay? That's the picture of what's going on, but it had to happen here, why? Jesus said the last days will not be as in the days of Noah, but it's emphatic, just as in the days of Noah. Demonic beings, came to earth taking a human incarn incarnate form and began procreating demonoids with human women. Now for some years I've been warning about two things, the demonic nature of extraterrestrial phenomena and that biogenetic engineering in the hands of fallen man are going to set the stage to make it entirely possible and plausible for that to happen again. You begin cloning humans, where are they going to get a spirit? We are on the precipice of something that's absolutely apocalyptic ultimately cataclysmic. No doubt in my mind that the stage is being set for what Jesus said would happen. Not the days of Noah, but just as in. Now we have other tapes explaining that. The reason I bring that out is this. According to the Apocrypha, Old Testament Apocrypha, not the Sudigrapha, but Apocrypha, in the days of Jared, 
the ones that Jude calls the sons of God, who are actually fallen angels, came down on this mountain. So they descended onto this mountain and had relations with human women. Just as they came down to this mountain, the Lord Jesus had to go up to this mountain. Okay? He represented the combination of the spiritual and the divine, not this pagan event that happened in the days of Jared that we read about in Jude's epistle and in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, and so on. So here we are at Caesarea Philippe, a place where men who claim to be a god and a god who claimed to be a man, Jesus encounters them, and one who is both god and man. You'll see the alcoves where the statuettes were of the nymphs for the pan worship. Later it was renamed after Nero and called the Neronium. But here Jesus makes his challenge. It is here the second lie of Roman Catholicism depends. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Turn with me, please, to Matthew 16. Verse 13, now Jesus was warning about their own religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in verse 12. And he says, beware of the leaven, the false doctrine fueled by, fueled by spiritual pride. So it was here he warned about false doctrine and leaders who preach it who are fueled by spiritual pride. And it's interesting that here the papacy makes its claim. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippe, he began asking his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Remember, when he comes to earth, it's never son of God. He's always called son of man. And they said, some say, Yohanan HaMatbil, John the Baptist. Others, Eliyahu Hanavi. Others, Yermiyahu Hanavi, or one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say I am? And he's asking here in the plural. And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Yeshua answered him and said to him, Shimon bar -Yonah. Blessed are you, Simon bar -Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, one of the names of his father was Jonah. Yonah, Hanavi. Sonship in Hebrew is not simply to do with pedigree. It's in the character of. As we've been studying Hamashiach ben Yosef, Hamashiach ben David, Messiah, son of David, Messiah, son of Joseph, in the character of. So Peter is in the character of Jonah. It was at the biblical port city of Jaffa that Jonah did not want to go to the Gentiles. And so it was at the same location, the biblical port city of Jaffa, that Peter did not wish to go to the Gentiles. He was in that character. That's the full implication of the meaning. Blessed are you, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. How do we deduce that Peter was the first pope? When in fact, in Acts chapter 15, at the first council of the church, it was James who presided, Yaakov, not Peter. When James spoke, he said, my brethren, listen to Peter, no, listen to me. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to me, no, and to us. One, the decision was corporate. The magisterium was corporate. James presided, not Peter. The papacy evolved after Constantine bequeathed the imperial properties in Rome to the bishop in Rome, relocating his own capital to Constantinople. And it came about through a series of historical claims and developed over the centuries. The papacy in its present form did not come about until about 1854, the first Vatican Council under Pius IX, the man who opposed democracy. Well, let's understand further. Where then did they get this about Peter? 
upon this rock. Thou art Petros. Originally, the cascade was here, fed by the melting snow caps from Mount Hermon abo above us. But with seismic activity, it's somewhat shifted. But this was the original. Washing out of here, and you'll see them all down in the brooks, millions and millions, maybe tens of millions of these. In Greek, Petros, Petros, Peter, Petros. This is the Petros. This is the Petra. In Hebrew, Sela and Evan. In Greek, Petros and Petra. There was a temple here, a temple built to Caesar. A temple, a building. Look at the ruins. Is the foundation of that temple built on a Petros or on Petra? It is built on Petra. You cannot build a building on a Petros. It is completely illogical. <laughs> Thou art Petros and upon the Petra. We are told repeatedly that Jesus is the rock. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 11. For no man can build a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is in Jesus Christ. He is the rock. We're told in 1 Corinthians 10, he is the rock from which the living water comes. You can only build on the rock, not on the chip of stone that breaks away from the rock, which is what a Petros is. Some say pebble, but in the setting, chip, chip. Washed out with the cascade from the rock. Well, how does the Roman church tell people that Peter is the rock? Quite simply, they lied. And they lie to this day. First of all, they had the Vulgate in Latin, a bad translation. When you go to the original Greek, they have a problem. To this day, the Catholic apologeticists like Scott Hahn, they can't tell you the truth. They have a big problem. So what they say is, well, Wait a minute, it's masculine and feminine, and Peter was a man, so Jesus couldn't use the word Petra, because that was feminine, so he uses the masculine. Either he's a blithering ignoramus or a charlatan. In the Greek language, you have masculine, feminine, and neuter, but it does not have to do with sex. Gender in Greek has to do with the construction of a word and the way it is used in the context. Jesus himself is called the Petra. Jesus is referred to by the feminine Petra in Corinthians. Hence, he lies, or else he's simply making it up and doesn't know what he's talking about. That's what they do. It's a complete lie. The next lie was I'm going to give you these keys, and you can bind and you can loose. Understand, bind, and loose. It is not the Church of Rome alone who concocts something preposterous from this. The Greek words for bind and loose are luo to loose and deo. They are translated directly from two juridical Hebrew terms, hatir and asur. Hatir means it is permitted. Asur means it is forbidden. In Jewish law, rabbinic law, halakha, you have a bet din, where a Jewish magistrate trained in halakha gives halakhic decisions on what is hetir, what is asur. And of the 613 commandments of the Torah, in order to save your life or the life of another person, a Jew can break all of the commandments except three. He can break the Sabbath, he can eat pork, anything, except idolatry, incest, and murder. Those remain asur. But to save a life, everything else becomes <laughs> hatir. It is a juridical term. The terms are used two ways in the New Testament. First of all, they're used by Matthew elsewhere, and before we look elsewhere, we should see how Matthew uses them. In Matthew 18, the terms are used about putting people out of fellowship, this fellowshipping people. You see your brother in sin, you go to him. 
If he doesn't repent, you go with two or three witnesses, then you bring it to the congregation. And if he still doesn't repent, then you kick him out. Whatever you bind in heaven, bind shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose shall be loosed in heaven. It's talking about dealing with unrepentant sin in the fellowship. However, the Greek is present continuous active. It doesn't say you can bind it or you can loose it. It is whatever is being bound in heaven, you can bind. Whatever is being loosed in heaven, you can loose. Think of 1 Corinthians 5, where you had that young man in the fellowship who was into an incestuous relationship. Paul said he gave him over to Satan because he did it by the Lord. The Lord showed him to do it. We cannot arbitrarily go around binding and loosing anything. It has to be being done in heaven and revealed by the Holy Spirit. The second is the juridical application concerning doctrine. Acts chapter 15. Well, what about these non-Jews who are being saved, believing in a Jewish Messiah, Yeshua? Hamashiach Yeshua Adonenu. Maitam, what about them? Do they eat pork? Do they have to have a mezuzah on the door? Do they have to have the Jewish feasts? It's all hit here. They are loosed from the requirements of the law of Moses. What remains a sore is immorality, that which is strangled, cruelty to animals which had a pagan association, blood, food sacrificed to idols like transubstantiation, Roman Eucharist, those things are outlawed. The rest is hatir, permitted, luo deo. The apostles said, it seemed, James speaking said, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Binding and loosing has those two meanings and those two meanings alone. Now we know that the Roman Catholic Church invents doctrine, claiming the right to invent and define doctrine. That is simply not biblical. Jesus gave those keys to the apostles corporately, not just to Peter. This is quite clear from the Greek and quite clear from the internal evidence of the New Testament. More than that, no place did he give them the authority to pass it on to others. The apostles wrote the New Testament under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit, having been tutored personally by Jesus and before him by John the Baptist, Johannan Matbiel. No place was that authority to be passed on. The Roman Catholic Church admits, I read Bill Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, that there were contradictory lists of bishops in Rome and there was no consensus until the fifth century. Why did James preside? We're the first church because of Peter. Now, the Greek Orthodox Church is technically older. The Armenian Church is technically older. The Coptic Church is at least as old. But the Book of Acts tells us the first church was the Jewish Church. That's what the Bible says. Now, you have people saying binding loosing, people who write silly books, people like John Dawson, the whole youth of the mission garbage and stupidity the Roger Forster nonsense in England, where we're gonna have the march for Jesus and take authority over the, over the principalities and bind them. In Acts chapter 17, Paul's spirit was vexed by the idols. Paul said, other idols, these idols are demons, demonoi, quoting Moses, Shadim, they're demons. Are Krishna is a demon. Rama, Shitra is a demon. Shiva, of whom the Pope took the anointing of Shiva on his forehead is a demon and says he was vexed. If you come with us next year to Athens, we bring you to the Areopagus. You can look up and see the Parthenon, and you can look down and see the Agarot, the market where the synagogue was. What did Paul do when his spirit was vexed by the demons of Athena worship? We bind the spirit of Athena worship in the name of Jesus and we take authority over, no. He debated the Areopagites on Mars Hill and he preached the gospel. He said, these are our weapons. Put on the armor of God. Put on the shoes of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and pick up the sword. Evangelism was his weapon. In other words, you can either believe Roger Forster, John Dawson, Youth of the Mission, these other silly people, or you can believe the word of God, but you can't believe both. Binding and loosing has nothing to do with that. I'll give you the keys. We saw that ridiculous statue of Peter at Peter's primacy yesterday, holding a big key. And the Catholic Church actually claimed 
that the key belonged to Peter and the Pope could say who could go to hell and who couldn't. Popes force nations to go to war, claiming to have that key. If you live in Great Britain, how did England first invade Ireland? King Henry II, who was a Norman, was threatened with excommunication by Pope Adrian IV that if he did not invade Ireland and put an end to the indigenous Celtic Church and bring them under Rome, he wouldn't get into heaven because he had the key. It was used for politics and money, and it still is to this day. But he doesn't have the key. Why? Because in Revelation 1, Jesus has that key. He didn't give it to Peter. He didn't give it to anybody. What then are these keys? Notice keys. Look at the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 11. Verse 52, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering you hindered. What Jesus was saying to the Sanhedrin, to the rabbinic establishment of his day is, the keys of unlocking the Bible, of understanding the scripture, you who know the Midrash, you've been unfaithful and misled the people and misused your power to make yourself rich. Instead of being servants, you became overlords, something replicated by the medieval papacy. So the keys of an understanding this book will be taken from you and given to these other Jews, the apostles. It was not to Peter, it was to the apostles. It was apostolic authority to define doctrine. They were able to bind and loose. And that's what exactly what they did in conclusion in Acts chapter 15. Let's look at it very briefly in conclusion. Verse 13, and after they stopped speaking, James answered saying, Brethren, listen to Peter, listen to the Pope, listen to the one who speaks ex cathedra, listen to the one who's infallible. No, he said, listen to me. Biblically, there's a much better case for James being the Pope, but he wasn't the Pope either. In fact, we read in Galatians chapter 2 that Paul openly rebuked Peter in the presence of all. When's the last time you saw a cardinal standing up to Pope John Paul II for his hypocrisy, or for taking the anointing of the Hindu goddess of death, Shiva, or for kissing the Koran while Christians are being murdered in Islamic countries? When did you see a bishop standing up to him for keeping his mouth shut about the widespread pedophilia of his cronies? Then he says, Simeon, Peter related how God concerned himself with the Gentiles as it is written. He quotes from Amos and various Old Testament prophets. And then he says, it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them. Notice the leadership was always corporate. But in verse 29, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Not James, not Peter issued an autocratic decree. It was corporate. And they could only bind and loose what the Holy Spirit was binding and loosing. The Greek is present continuous active. That which is being bound in heaven, that which is being loosed in heaven. It was the apostolic authority to define doctrine, or it was the church's authority to deal with unrepentant sin. It's nothing to do with the lies of Rome, or the lies with youth at the mission, or the lies of Roger Foster, or the lies of John Dawson. These are all lies of Satan. It happened here, where Jesus challenged the gods of this world on their own turf. Quesadilla Felipe. Now, I'm not angry at anybody. Concerning my fellow evangelicals who are into binding and loosing, I assure you, I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit understood and practiced biblically. I believe in spiritual warfare as the Bible teaches it. But what you see going on today with the binding and loosing phenomena is not what the Bible teaches. It is a silly invention of ignorant men. Binding the strong man has nothing to do with binding and loosing. Binding the strong man rather has to do with the impossibility of leading someone to Christ while they are demon-possessed. Exegetically, it is all nonsense. I would also point out that in no sense am I against anybody by way of their background. My own family is a mixture of Roman Catholic and Jewish. 
I want the Jewish people to know the truth, that Yeshua, Jesus, is Messiah. And I want the Catholic people to know, including my Catholic family, that the Pope is not the heir of Peter, and Roman Catholicism is in no sense biblical Christianity. It is simply not what Jesus and the apostles taught. The Roman Catholic Church claims that it gets its doctrines from the apostles via the Church Fathers, the patristic literature. The Church Fathers were divided about the rock. The majority of the Church Fathers said that the rock was Christ. A minority of the Church Fathers said that the rock was the faith of Peter, not Peter himself. Most said the rock was Christ. Some said the rock was the faith of Peter. None, not one, none of the patristics, none of the Church Fathers said that the rock was Peter. Now, patristic authority, the Church Fathers, are not apostolic authority. It's not biblical authority. Nonetheless, even if it was, you still could not say Peter was the first pope.